Hey folks, before the video starts, please leave a like and subscribe to cheer me up. Make sure you are relaxed and enjoy today's stories. I found a job on the dark web to watch people sleep. One of them woke up and asked for me by name. So yeah, I know how this is going to sound, but bear with me, all right? It started a few months ago, during a rough patch in my life. I was broke, like really broke, and desperate for any kind of work. I was living in this dingy little apartment, barely scraping by on odd jobs and handouts from friends. You know that feeling when you check your bank account and it's so low, you wonder how you're going to eat next week. That was me, man. I was deep in it. One night... I found myself scrolling Reddit, and, well, one thing led to another, and I started wandering around the internet like I usually do when I can't sleep. I don't know why, but I've always had this weird fascination with the deep web. Nothing too crazy, just lurking, you know. I'd heard all the horror stories and watched enough YouTube videos about the dark web to know better than to mess with it. But at the same time, the curiosity was always there, scratching at the back of my brain. Anyway, that night I stumbled on this forum. Not one of those super sketchy ones with drug deals or whatever, but it was... Odd. The title of the thread caught my eye. Easy money. Watch people sleep. Sounds innocent enough, right? I clicked on it. Because, I mean, why not? At this point... I was willing to do almost anything for some extra cash. The post was simple. We're looking for people to monitor live video feeds of subjects sleeping. Pay is $200 a night. No interaction necessary. Just watch and report if anything unusual happens. Now, I know what you're thinking because I was thinking the same thing. Who in their right mind would pay someone to watch people sleep. It sounded like some voyeuristic nonsense, but $200 a night was $200 a night. And like I said, I was desperate. I clicked the link at the bottom of the post, which took me to some sketchy looking website. No logos, no flashy design, just a plain black page with a single box that said, apply. I hesitated for a second, hovering over the mouse. My gut told me to back out, but my wallet was screaming louder, so I filled out the form. It wasn't anything crazy, just the usual stuff. Name, email, preferred hours. I even used a burner email just in case. After I hit submit, I figured that would be the end of it. Maybe I'd get a scammy email, or nothing at all. But the next day, I got a response. They said I was hired, just like that. No interview, no background check. The email included instructions on how to log into the camera feeds and start my shift that night. They gave me an encrypted link and a password to access the feed. Honestly, I didn't think much of it. I figured it was some rich weirdo's idea of a joke, or maybe it was some social experiment for a YouTube channel. Either way, I didn't care. I just wanted that money. That night, I logged into the feed at 11 p.m. like they said. There were three camera feeds to monitor, each showing different bedrooms. It was pretty normal at first. The people were just sleeping. One guy looked like he was in his late 20s, a regular dude with a scruffy beard and messy room. The second feed showed an older woman, probably in her 50s or 60s, with a cat curled up next to her. The third one, though, gave me the creeps right away. It was a young girl, probably in her early teens, sleeping in this sterile-looking room. Everything was too neat, too perfect. Something about it felt off, but I couldn't put my finger on it. The job was simple enough, though. Just watch. And I did. 
For a few nights, nothing weird happened. The people just slept, sometimes rolling over or mumbling in their sleep. But that was about it. Easy money, right? But then, things started to get weird. It was about my fifth night on the job, and I was half asleep myself, when I noticed something strange in the third feed, the girl's room. She hadn't moved at all in the past hour, which wasn't that unusual, but suddenly, the camera started glitching. It wasn't like static or anything, more like the frame would freeze and then jump forward a few seconds. At first, I thought it was just a bad connection, but then I noticed something. Every time the feed jumped, the girl's eyes were in a different position, not just closed or half open, but looking directly at the camera. I leaned closer to my screen, my heart starting to race. Was she awake? No, it couldn't be. Her chest was rising and falling like she was asleep, but her eyes, they were definitely open and staring. Right, address me. I sat there frozen, unsure of what to do. Should I report it? I remembered the instructions. Only report if something unusual happens. But what the hell was I supposed to call this? Before I could decide, the feed cut out completely. Just a black screen with a little loading symbol in the corner. I waited for it to come back, but it never did. The other two feeds were still running, but that third one, gone. I stayed up until my shift ended at 7 a.m., but the camera never came back online. I was too freaked out to sleep afterward, so I just laid in bed, staring at the ceiling, trying to convince myself that I'd imagined the whole thing. Maybe I was tired. Maybe the camera was glitching out. Maybe. But then I got the email. It came through right at 8 a.m. The subject line just said, She knows. And that's when I realized I was in way over my head. I didn't sleep that day. How could I? After that email, she knows. There was no chance in hell I was going to close my eyes. I sat there, staring at my screen, waiting for something else to happen. Maybe a follow-up email. Maybe a glitch in the other camera feeds. But nothing. Just silence. I tried telling myself it was a joke. Maybe someone from the website was messing with me, testing how far I'd go. But the problem with that theory was, no one was supposed to have my real email. Remember how I said I used a burner when I applied? Yeah, that was what I checked. The burner account. But that email didn't go there. It went straight to my personal inbox, the one I never linked to the job. The one I only used for important stuff. So, either someone had hacked me, or this whole thing was something else entirely. I don't know why, but I didn't quit. Maybe I was too stubborn, or maybe I was just too curious for my own good. There was also the money. They had already sent me the first payment after a few nights. $200 in my account, just like they promised. When you're broke, that kind of cash keeps you going, even when you're spooked out of your mind. That night, I logged back into the feed, heart pounding in my chest. All three cameras were back up, including the one that had cut out the night before. The girl was there, sleeping, like nothing had happened. For a moment, I thought about quitting right then and there, but something told me I had to see it through, at least one more night, just to see if it would happen again. Maybe I could explain it away. Maybe it was all in my head. The hours dragged by, slow and heavy, like the air itself was thickening around me. The first two feeds were quiet as usual, the guy tossing and turning, the old lady's cat occasionally stretching out across the bed. But the third feed, it was like I couldn't take my eyes off it. The girl didn't move much at first. She just lay there, her face peaceful, her breathing steady. 
but around 3 a.m., the camera started glitching again. My stomach tightened immediately. This time, it wasn't jumping forward in time. It was slower, like a subtle lag, as if reality itself was dragging. The frame would freeze for half a second, then resume, then freeze again. And then, I saw it. Her eyes. They were closed one moment, then half open the next, just like before. But this time, they didn't stop at half open. They opened all the way, her pupils darting around the room, like she was looking for something or someone. Her head didn't move, just her eyes, scanning the space around her. I could feel my pulse in my throat. There was no way this was normal. No way this was a coincidence. And then she looked straight into the camera again. No, that's not right. She looked straight at me. I swear to God, I felt her eyes lock onto mine through the screen, like she knew I was there, watching her. Her face was still completely relaxed, like she was asleep, but her eyes were wide open, tracking me. I shifted in my chair, trying to convince myself it was just a trick of the camera. Maybe it was the angle. Maybe it was. Then she smiled. It was the smallest smile, the corners of her lips twitching up ever so slightly, but it was enough, enough to make my blood run cold. Before I could react, the screen flickered again, and the feed cut out, just like before. Same black screen, same spinning loading icon. I slammed my laptop shut and pushed it away from me, my hands trembling. I wanted to scream, to throw my laptop across the room. But I just sat there, frozen, staring at the closed lid. I didn't know what was happening, but I knew I wanted out. I was done. No more money. No more watching strangers sleep. I wasn't even sure I could sleep myself at that point. My eyes felt like they were glued open, and every time I blinked, I saw her face, her eyes, her smile, burned into the back of my mind. But that wasn't the worst part. No, the worst part came when I checked my phone. There was a text waiting for me. It was from an unknown number. My fingers shook as I unlocked my phone and opened the message. Why did you close the laptop? My name. I wasn't done watching you. I dropped the phone. Literally. Just let it fall from my hands onto the floor. My mouth went dry. She had used my name, not my username, not some generic, hey you nonsense, my real name. I sat there in shock, the text still glowing on the screen below me. It didn't make sense. None of this made sense. How did she know my name? How did she know I was there? For hours, I paced around my apartment, trying to figure out what the hell I'd gotten myself into. I thought about going to the police, but what would I even say? Hey, officer, I was watching people sleep on a sketchy, deep website, and now one of them knows my name. Yeah, that'd go over real well. Finally, I convinced myself it was some kind of elaborate prank. Maybe the website had planted spyware on my laptop or something, and they were using it to freak me out. I ran every virus scan I could think of, but nothing came up. My system was clean, but deep down, I knew it wasn't that simple. I could feel it in my bones. Something else was going on. Something I couldn't explain away with tech support or rational thinking. I didn't sleep that night. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw her face, her eyes, that smile. The next day, I got another email. It didn't say much, just one line. We're watching you now, and attached to it. A video file. I don't know why I opened it. Maybe I wanted proof. Maybe I needed to know for sure that this wasn't some insane nightmare I couldn't wake up from. But when I clicked the file, it wasn't what I expected. It was a camera feed of my apartment, the exact angle I was sitting at right now. 
I was the one being watched. I stared at the video file, my mind struggling to process what I was seeing. It was my apartment, the dim light from my single lamp, the creaky chair I was sitting in, the unwashed dishes on the counter in the background, everything. It was like I was looking into a mirror, except the camera wasn't mine. Someone, no, something was watching me. The feed was grainy, but clear enough to send a shock of terror straight through me. I scanned the room with my eyes, looking for any sign of a camera, but everything looked the same as always. No hidden lens, no telltale blinking lights, nothing. I checked my laptop, then my phone. Both were clean as far as I could tell, but that didn't calm me down, not even close. My brain was buzzing, thoughts racing faster than I could grab onto them. How long had they been watching me? Was this part of the job? Had they been spying on me the whole time, even before I signed up? I mean, it was the dark web. But this? I was paralyzed. I wanted to run, to pack up my stuff, and get out of there. But I was frozen in place, my eyes glued to the screen. As if reading my mind, the video feed flickered for a second, and then I saw something that made my blood go cold. In the corner of the frame, by the door, barely noticeable at first, was a shadow, a figure. It was small, almost childlike. My heart skipped a beat when I realized it was moving, slowly, like it was creeping through the room, staying just out of view. The figure stepped closer, and for a split second, I saw it. Her. It was the girl. The one from the camera feed. The one who'd been watching me. But this wasn't some random coincidence. This wasn't just a video feed glitching out. She was here. In my apartment. I scrambled to my feet, almost knocking my chair over in the process. My mind was screaming at me to move. To get out. But my body wouldn't cooperate. I could barely breathe, let alone think straight. The image of her slowly approaching, the way her eyes locked onto the camera, haunted me. She wasn't just watching anymore. She was here, physically, and that broke something inside me. The line between what was real and what wasn't started to blur. I grabbed the closest thing I could find, a half-empty bottle of water and backed away from the screen, my heart pounding so hard I thought it was going to burst. My hands were shaking so badly I could barely keep a grip on the bottle. And then, in the feed, she smiled. It was that same smile I'd seen before. That tiny, knowing smirk, like she had me exactly where she wanted me. I watched in horror as her hand reached towards the door handle in the video my door handle. I spun around to face the door, expecting it to start creaking open at any second. I backed up against the wall, my pulse hammering in my ears. I could barely hear anything over the sound of my own breathing, ragged and desperate. But the door didn't open. Nothing happened. After a few minutes, though it felt like hours, I forced myself to look back at the screen. The feed had gone black again, just like before. That spinning little icon in the corner. The girl was gone. No shadow, no movement. Just the empty room. I should have felt relieved, but I didn't. There was no relief. Not anymore. I couldn't stay there. I couldn't risk it. Grabbing my keys and my jacket, I bolted out of the apartment. I didn't care that it was the middle of the night. I didn't care that I had no real plan, nowhere to go. I just needed to get out of there, away from that screen, that camera, those eyes. I drove for hours, not really thinking, just moving. I didn't even know where I was going, but I ended up at this 24-hour diner on the outskirts of town. I sat in a booth at the back, shaking, 
staring down at my cold cup of coffee, my mind going in a hundred different directions. The fluorescent lights overhead buzzed softly, the faint sound of the waitress flipping through a magazine, the only noise besides my own breathing. I kept checking my phone, expecting another message, another video, but nothing came. Maybe I was finally in the clear. Maybe, by running, I'd gotten away from whatever was happening. But then, I made the mistake of checking my email. There was a new message waiting for me. I almost didn't want to open it, but I couldn't help myself. My hand hovered over the screen for a moment before I tapped it. This one wasn't from the anonymous account. It was from me, my own email address. The subject line read, You can't hide. I felt sick. My hands were clammy, and my head started spinning. How the hell did they spoof my email? I knew people could do that, but it was different seeing it happen to you. I opened the email, my stomach twisting in knots, and there was nothing in the body of the message. Just a link. I shouldn't have clicked it. I knew better. But I had to know what was waiting for me. The link took me to another video feed, but this time, it wasn't of my apartment. It was of the diner, the exact booth I was sitting in, the exact angle from behind my shoulder, looking at the back of my head. I turned around, my breath catching in my throat, but there was no one there. The booth behind me was empty. The entire diner was almost deserted. Just an old couple in the far corner, and the waitress, still flipping through her magazine. I looked back at the screen. The video was still there, still showing me from behind. But as I stared at it, something started to change. The camera zoomed in, slowly but surely, until it was focused on the back of my head. Then it panned up, inching closer and closer to my face. In the reflection of my phone screen, I saw it, a dark shape behind me, just out of focus. I dropped the phone and jumped out of the booth, my chair clattering to the ground. The couple in the corner looked up, startled, but I didn't care. I ran out of the diner, not even stopping to pay for my coffee. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know who was watching me or why. But I knew one thing for sure. They weren't done with me yet. I drove for what felt like hours, gripping the steering wheel so tight, my knuckles turned white. I didn't have a destination in mind. I just needed to get away from that diner. Away from the cameras. Away from her. Every time I glanced in the rearview mirror, I half expected to see someone sitting in the back seat. That same shadowy figure from the video feed. My mind was unraveling, and I didn't know how to stop it. I ended up parking in some random lot outside of a motel. It was one of those rundown places with flickering neon signs, the kind of place people go to disappear. That's exactly what I needed. I grabbed my phone and threw it into the glove compartment, too scared to look at it again. At this point, it felt like the phone was some kind of cursed object. The more I used it, the worse things got. I checked into the motel under a fake name. I knew it wouldn't help. Not really. But it gave me a sliver of comfort. Maybe, just maybe, it would throw them off. Whoever they were. The guy at the desk barely looked at me, handing me the key with a grunt before going back to his TV fine by me. The less interaction, the better. The room was as bad as I expected. Peeling wallpaper, a bed that creaked with every step, a TV that looked like it hadn't worked in years. I didn't care. I wasn't there for luxury. I just needed a place to hide. I locked the door behind me, then shoved the desk chair under the doorknob for good measure. It was a small gesture but it made me feel a little safer. Safer, but not safe. I wasn't sure I'd ever feel that again. 
I sat on the edge of the bed, staring at the black screen of the TV, my mind racing. What was I supposed to do now? I couldn't go to the cops. They'd laugh me out of the station, or worse, they'd think I was crazy. I couldn't go home either. They knew where I lived. They'd been in my apartment somehow. They'd sent me a video of me. My head was spinning, and exhaustion was starting to catch up to me. I hadn't slept properly in days, and the adrenaline was only going to carry me so far. I lay back on the bed, my eyes burning, but every time I closed them, I saw her face. The girl from the feed. That smile. I must have dozed off at some point, because the next thing I remember is waking up to the sound of something tapping. It was soft at first, like the faintest knock on a door. My eyes snapped open, and for a second, I thought it was just part of a dream. But then I heard it again. Tap, tap, tap. It was coming from the window. I sat up in bed, my heart pounding in my chest. The room was pitch black, except for the faint glow of a streetlight filtering through the thin curtains. My eyes locked on the window, and I saw it. Mm. Just the faintest shadow moving outside, like someone standing just out of view. I froze. There was no way. I was on the second floor. The tapping continued, more insistent this time, like whoever or whatever was out there wanted to be let in. I grabbed the lamp from the nightstand, my only weapon, and stood up slowly. My hands were shaking so badly, I almost dropped it. I inched toward the window, every muscle in my body screaming at me to run, to get the hell out of there, but I couldn't leave without knowing. When I finally got close enough to the window, I reached out and yanked the curtain aside. Nothing. There was nothing there. No person, no shadow, nothing but the empty parking lot below and the dim glow of the motel's flickering sign. My breath was coming in shallow gasps, and I backed away from the window, clutching the lamp like it was a lifeline. That's when I heard the door handle rattle. I spun around, staring at the door. The handle jiggled again, harder this time. Whoever was on the other side wasn't knocking. They were trying to get in. The chair I'd wedged under the handle held, but I knew it wouldn't last long. I stumbled back toward the bed, my mind racing, trying to figure out what the hell to do. Was it her? Had she found me again? Or was it something else entirely? The rattling stopped. For a moment, everything was dead silent, and I almost convinced myself that whoever it was had given up. Maybe they'd moved on to another room, another unlucky victim. Then the knocking started. Except it wasn't coming from the door anymore. It was coming from the closet. My body went cold. There was no way. I hadn't heard anyone come in. The closet had been empty when I checked the room earlier. But the knocking was unmistakable now. A rhythmic pounding that made my skin crawl. I didn't want to look. I didn't want to know what was behind that door. But I couldn't stop myself. I inched toward the closet, my heart hammering so loud I was sure it would drown out the knocking. The lamp in my hand felt useless, like it wouldn't do a damn thing against whatever was on the other side. Still, I held it tight, my last pathetic defense. I reached for the closet door, my fingers trembling as they hovered over the handle. I was shaking so badly I almost couldn't grab it but I forced myself to pull it open in one swift motion. Empty. There was nothing inside. Just a dusty old shelf and a few metal hangers clinking against each other. I let out a shaky breath, my knees threatening to give out from the relief. And then I felt it. A cold breath, right on the back of my neck. I whipped around, but there was no one there. No one in the room with me. Just the empty bed and the dark corners that seemed to stretch on forever. But I could feel it. 
Something was in there with me, watching me, waiting. My phone buzzed from the glove compartment in the car. The sound cut through the air like a scream, jolting me out of my frozen state. Against all logic, I grabbed my jacket and ran out the door, down the stairs, and into the parking lot. I didn't care how crazy I looked. I just needed to get to the car, to check that phone, to know what was happening. When I reached the car, I threw open the door and yanked the phone out of the glove compartment. Another message. I didn't want to open it. Every part of me was screaming not to, but my thumb moved on its own, unlocking the screen and pulling up the message. There was no text this time, just a picture. A picture of me standing at the closet in that motel room, my back turned and something dark and blurry right behind me. The caption at the bottom was simple, you're not alone. I stood in the parking lot, clutching my phone, my breath coming in shallow gasps. The photo, the one of me standing in the motel room with that thing behind me, was burned into my mind. It didn't make sense. Nothing made sense anymore. I was losing track of time, of reality. I could feel it slipping away like sand through my fingers, but I had to hold on. I glanced around the empty parking lot, lit only by the flickering neon sign. The night felt too still, too quiet, like the world itself was holding its breath, waiting for something to happen. I needed to leave. I needed to get as far away from that motel as possible. But where could I go? My options were running thin. Whoever or whatever was doing this had found me here, and they'd find me anywhere. It was clear now that there was no outrunning this, no hiding. They had been watching me from the start, and now they were closing in. I got into my car and started the engine, not caring where I was headed as long as it was away. I sped out of the lot, not looking back at the motel. My phone buzzed in the passenger seat, but I ignored it. I didn't need another reminder that they were watching me. The road stretched out ahead of me, dark and empty. The only sound was the low hum of the engine and the tires on the asphalt. I kept driving, hoping that somehow, if I went far enough, I'd outrun this nightmare. But deep down, I knew it wouldn't be that easy. After about an hour, I pulled over to the side of the road. I couldn't keep driving aimlessly forever. I had to think. I had to figure out what was going on. I opened my phone. Another message, of course. This time, it wasn't a picture. It was a link. The same kind of link they'd sent before, back when this all started. A live feed. My thumb hovered over the screen. I didn't want to see it. I didn't want to know what they were showing me now, but I had no choice. I clicked the link. The screen went black for a moment, then flickered to life. The camera feed was grainy, but I recognized the setting immediately. It was my apartment. The same dingy place I had tried to escape from, now appearing on my screen like a haunting memory. The camera was facing my bed, where I hadn't been in days. At first, everything looked normal. Just an empty room, quiet and still. But then the camera started moving, panning slowly across the space, as if someone was holding it, walking through my apartment. My stomach dropped when the camera turned toward the closet door. The door creaked open, slowly, deliberately, and there, standing inside, was her, the girl from the sleep feed. She stepped out of the closet, her face pale and expressionless, her eyes wide open and unblinking, staring directly into the camera. There was no smile this time, no twisted smirk, just cold, dead eyes locked on the lens as she walked toward the bed. The feed cut out for a moment, and when it came back, 
The camera was on the floor, facing the bed. Someone was lying there now. It was me. My heart stopped. I was staring at myself, lying in my own bed, as if I had never left. But it wasn't just me. The girl was there, standing over the bed, watching the figure that looked exactly like me, her face still blank, her eyes still cold. I tried to tell myself it was a trick, a recording, something that wasn't real. But the longer I stared at it, the more I realized that I wasn't looking at a recording of the past. I was watching what was happening right now. The phone slipped from my hand, clattering onto the passenger seat. I couldn't take my eyes off the screen. The girl in the feed moved closer to the bed, closer to me, her movements slow and deliberate, as if she had all the time in the world. Then she spoke. She whispered something, her lips barely moving, but the words rang in my head, clear as day. Time to wake up. The figure in the bed, my figure, opened its eyes, slowly, groggily, and then it smiled. It was my face, my body, but it wasn't me. Not anymore. I reached for the phone, my hand shaking so badly I could barely grip it. I closed the feed, my heart pounding, sweat dripping down the back of my neck. This was real. This was really happening. I was watching someone else wear my life. They had taken me, replaced me, and now they were watching to see how long it would take before I realized the truth. I wasn't the one doing the watching anymore. I was the one being watched. I started the car again, my hands trembling, my mind racing. I didn't know what to do, where to go. But I knew one thing. I couldn't go back. Not to my apartment. Not to that bed. Because whatever was there now, it wasn't me. And whoever was watching from the other side of the camera, they had won. My phone buzzed one last time, but I didn't need to look at it to know what it said. Good night. I paid a dark web service to fix my boss. He disappeared, and now the police are asking questions. Look, I know how this is going to sound. But I didn't mean for any of this to happen. I wasn't thinking. I was frustrated, angry, and in one of those headspaces where it felt like my world was collapsing. If you've ever had a boss who seemed hell-bent on making your life a living nightmare, maybe you'll understand. But what happened? It went so much further than I ever imagined. I work, or worked, I guess, at this small marketing agency. It's nothing glamorous, just your standard cubicle farm where creativity gets choked out by deadlines and your soul slowly dies under fluorescent lights. And my boss, Tim, was the absolute worst. You know the type, the guy who micromanages every second of your day, takes credit for your ideas and blames you when anything, literally anything, goes wrong. It started with an email. A harmless enough thing, right? Just another day in the office grind, my inbox flooded with reminders and requests, but this one caught my eye. The subject line read, Is your boss ruining your life? Fix it for good. It was probably spam. I should have just deleted it, but I didn't. I clicked. It led me to a page on the dark web. Yeah, I know how cliche this sounds. But hear me out, it wasn't one of those sites filled with red text, skull gifts, and creepy music like in the movies. It was clean, professional even, like it looked like a legitimate service page. The title, Fix Your Problem. The tagline underneath read, We specialize in handling difficult situations, no questions asked. I stared at it for way too long. I don't even know why. Maybe it was morbid curiosity. Or maybe it was because Tim had just finished tearing me apart in a meeting for no reason, and I was feeling like I was one email away from snapping. All I knew was that I was pissed, 
and this ad was feeding into that feeling in the worst way possible. At the bottom of the page was a simple message box where you could submit your problem. I closed the tab. I tried to go back to work, but my brain wouldn't let it go. It was like the idea had latched onto me, and every time I tried to focus on my spreadsheets or marketing pitches, I kept thinking about that damn email. Could they really fix my problem? What did that even mean? By the time lunch rolled around, I found myself back on that page, and before I even realized what I was doing, I started typing. My boss, Tim, is making my life hell. I want him gone. I didn't expect anything to come from it. I figured it was probably a scam or, at best, some trolling service that would send me a fake email back, maybe asking for money or something stupid. But less than an hour later, I got a reply. It was from someone named Operator. The message was short and simple. We can help you. One time payment, $500. You'll never hear from him again. I stared at that message for a good 10 minutes, my heart pounding. My palms were sweaty. This was insane, right? Like, I wasn't actually going to do this, but at the same time, it was almost too easy. I shut my laptop, walked to the break room, grabbed a coffee, tried to clear my head. But the thing is, when you've been stuck in a situation as miserable as mine for long enough, you start rationalizing all sorts of things. That anger festers. It makes you think doing something stupid isn't just possible, it's logical. When I got back to my desk, the message was still there, staring at me. The amount wasn't even that crazy. I had the money, and all I had to do was hit send one click. It could all be over. I could finally be free of Tim. I could stop feeling like a failure every day I walked into that office. I could breathe again. So, I did it. I made the payment. And for a while, I felt relief. Like maybe I just ordered some kind of cosmic justice. That night, I slept better than I had in months, convinced that nothing would come of it but feeling a twisted sort of satisfaction just for trying. The next day though, things started getting weird. Tim didn't show up for work. At first, I figured he was sick or on vacation or something, but then our HR rep came around, asking if anyone had heard from him. No one had. Days passed and Tim still wasn't back. People in the office were whispering about it. Some said he'd quit. Others joked that he finally had a nervous breakdown, but no one really knew what was going on. It wasn't until the end of that week that I started getting worried. I got an email. This time, it wasn't from Operator. It was from Tim's wife. She was looking for him. She said he'd been missing for days. She asked if I knew anything, if maybe he had mentioned something to me at work some clue about where he could have gone. I didn't know what to say. Obviously, I didn't tell her about the dark web service. I just told her the truth, that I hadn't seen him since the last time we were in the office together. But that pit in my stomach was getting bigger. Something wasn't right. I thought maybe I'd been scammed. Maybe this whole thing was some twisted prank or just a way to get me to fork over money. But the fact was, Tim was gone. And then, this morning, the police showed up at my apartment. I'm not sure what to do. I didn't ask for this. Not really. I didn't think it would actually go this far. But now Tim is missing. His wife is desperate for answers. And the police. They're starting to ask questions too questions I don't know how to answer. And honestly, I'm terrified of what might happen next. I sat there, staring at the police officer in my doorway, my stomach in knots. He wasn't in uniform, plain clothes, which somehow made it worse. He introduced himself as Detective Mason. 
He had this calm, practiced way about him, like he'd done this a thousand times before. I guess to him, it was just another missing person case. To me, it felt like my life was closing in on itself. Mind if I come in? He asked, and I felt like I didn't really have a choice. You can't just say no to the police, right? So I let him in. The question started off simple, like he was trying to ease me into it. When was the last time I'd seen Tim? Had he seemed off lately? Did he mention anything strange before he disappeared? I answered as best as I could, trying to keep my voice steady, but inside my mind was racing. Did they know? Did they have any idea what I'd done? I mean, how could they? It was the dark web. I hadn't left a trail. At least, I didn't think I had. Detective Mason pulled out a notepad and jotted down a few things, nodding like everything I was saying was routine. But then he paused and looked up at me, his eyes narrowing just a bit. Did Tim ever seem afraid of anyone? Maybe he got himself into something, he asked. I froze. That word, afraid, hit me like a punch to the gut. It felt too close, too personal, like he knew something. I swallowed hard and shook my head. Not that I know of. He didn't really talk to me about his personal life. The detective stared at me for a second too long, then scribbled something down. He thanked me for my time and told me he might be back if they had more questions. As soon as I shut the door behind him, I collapsed onto the couch, my heart pounding so hard I thought it might burst. This was getting out of control. I had no idea what happened to Tim, but I knew one thing for sure. It wasn't normal. I mean, people don't just vanish without a trace, and it couldn't be a coincidence that he disappeared right after I hired that service. I needed answers. I pulled out my laptop and opened the browser, hands shaking as I typed in the address for the dark website again. The page was still there, exactly as I remembered it, cold and clean, with that same tagline staring back at me. Fix your problem. I went to my email and found the message from the operator. My mouth went dry as I stared at it. The payment had been made. They delivered on their promise. But now I needed more. I clicked reply and typed out a frantic message. What did you do to him? This wasn't what I wanted. He's missing and the police are asking questions. Please, I need to know what happened. I hit send and then I waited. The minutes felt like hours. My mind was spiraling, my thoughts darting from one worst case scenario to the next. What if they came after me next? What if Tim was dead and it was somehow my fault? Just when I thought I couldn't take it anymore, a reply popped up in my inbox. I clicked it open, my fingers trembling. The message was short, just three words, he's been handled. That's it. No explanation, no details. Just handled. My stomach dropped. What the hell did that mean? Was he dead? Was he locked up somewhere? My mind raced with possibilities, each more terrifying than the last. I tried replying again, demanding more answers. But after that, there was nothing. Radio silence. The next day at work was a blur. The office was quieter than usual, everyone on edge. Tim's disappearance had officially become the office gossip. People were saying things like, he probably just took off, midlife crisis or something, but I knew better. I knew he hadn't just left. And then something else happened, something that sent chills down my spine. As I was sitting at my desk, pretending to work, I got a notification. It was a file sharing link, sent anonymously. I hesitated for a moment, then clicked on it. What I saw made my blood run cold. It was security footage of my apartment building. The video showed me, standing in the doorway, 
with Detective Mason inviting him inside. I watched as we walked into my apartment, the door closing behind us. The camera angle was distant, like it was shot from across the street or something. The timestamp, yesterday, right when the detective came to question me, someone had been watching me. I slammed my laptop shut, my heart hammering in my chest. I felt sick. It was one thing to hire a shady service from the dark web. It was another thing entirely to realize that whoever I had hired was now keeping tabs on me. I wasn't just a customer, I was a liability. That night, I barely slept. Every creak of the floor, every gust of wind against my window made me jump. I started to feel like I wasn't alone in my own apartment, like eyes were always on me, just out of sight. And worse, the guilt was eating me alive. I had wanted Tim gone, but I never thought it would actually happen. And now it had, and I didn't even know what gone meant. I started to wonder if the operator would come after me next. Maybe I'd asked too many questions. Maybe I'd become the next problem that needed fixing. My paranoia grew with every passing hour. I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't sleep. And every time I walked outside, I had this crawling feeling on the back of my neck, like I was being watched. The next morning, I got a knock on my door again. My heart leapt into my throat as I opened it, expecting the worst. But it wasn't the operator. It was the police. Mr. Carter, Detective Mason said, his voice serious. We've got some new developments in Tim's case. We need you to come down to the station. It's urgent. My blood ran cold. It was happening. Whatever this was, I wasn't going to be able to run from it much longer. My hands were shaking as I followed Detective Mason into the station. I kept telling myself to stay calm, that this was just routine, that they didn't know anything, but I couldn't shake the feeling that this was the beginning of the end. The fluorescent lights inside the police station buzzed faintly, flickering every now and then. It made the whole place feel off, like something was wrong beneath the surface. Or maybe that was just me, projecting. They led me to a small, windowless room, just a table, two chairs, and a one-way mirror. The kind of room you see in every cop show. But when you're sitting there in real life, it's a whole different experience. It feels colder, tighter. Detective Mason sat across from me, his face unreadable. He laid a small file down on the table, tapped it with his fingers a couple of times before finally looking at me. You're probably wondering why you're here, he said, his voice calm, but his eyes had this intensity that made me feel like a bug under a microscope. I nodded, swallowing the lump in my throat. He flipped open the file, revealing a few grainy black and white photos. My heart skipped a beat when I realized what I was looking at. They were surveillance images, shots of me walking into my apartment, standing in the doorway with Mason, the same footage that had been sent to me anonymously the day before. We received these last night, Mason said, his eyes not leaving my face. From an unknown source, do you have any idea why someone would be watching you? I blinked, my mouth suddenly dry. How could I explain that I'd hired some mysterious dark web service to make my boss disappear? I couldn't. There was no way to come out of this without sounding completely insane or guilty. I... I don't know, I stammered. Why would anyone be watching me? Mason narrowed his eyes, leaning forward just slightly. That's what we're trying to figure out. We know you were one of the last people to have contact with Tim before he went missing. And now, someone's sending us surveillance footage of you. That's not a coincidence. Mr. Carter, 
I felt trapped, like the walls were closing in on me. But what could I say? I couldn't tell them the truth, not without ending up in a situation far worse than this. I don't know what to tell you, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. I haven't seen Tim since he disappeared. I don't know who's sending those videos, but I swear, I didn't do anything. Mason stared at me for what felt like an eternity, his gaze heavy, like he was trying to dig into my soul. Finally, he leaned back in his chair and crossed his arms. You're not under arrest, he said, but I suggest you stay in town. If we find out you're involved in any way, things will go downhill for you real fast. I nodded, my heart still pounding in my chest, and after what felt like an eternity, they let me leave. But the whole way home, I couldn't shake the feeling that something worse was coming. This wasn't over. It was only getting started. I got back to my apartment and locked the door behind me, double-checking the deadbolt, even though I knew it wouldn't make a difference. I paced around the living room, my mind racing. What was I supposed to do now? I couldn't go to the police. They'd just think I was crazy. And whoever the operator was, they were watching me. That much was clear. I felt like I was being suffocated by the weight of it all. I hadn't wanted this. I never wanted Tim to vanish. All I wanted was for him to back off, to leave me alone. I didn't ask for this nightmare. As I sat down on the couch, trying to calm my racing thoughts, my phone buzzed. I jumped, the sudden noise jarring me from my spiral of panic. It was a text from an unknown number. The message was simple. Stop asking questions. I stared at it, my pulse quickening. It had to be the operator. They were watching, and they knew I'd been asking questions, trying to dig into what had happened to Tim. My mind flashed back to the anonymous video, to the sense that I wasn't alone, that someone was always just out of sight, watching my every move. I texted back before I could even think it through. What did you do to him? Where is he? Three dots appeared on the screen, showing that the person on the other end was typing. I watched, holding my breath, waiting for the response. The dots disappeared. Then they came back. Then nothing. Whoever it was, they were toying with me, letting the anxiety build. I was about to throw my phone across the room in frustration when the message finally came through. Keep pushing and you'll end up just like him. That was it. No answers, no explanations, just a threat. My blood turned to ice as I stared at the screen. I didn't know if they were bluffing or if they actually had the power to make me disappear too. But at this point, I couldn't take any chances. I shut my phone off, trying to shake the feeling that I was being watched even in my own home. I pulled the curtains closed, checked the locks again, but nothing seemed to help. That creeping paranoia was settling into my bones. No matter where I went, I could feel the operator's eyes on me, like they were just waiting for me to slip up. I didn't sleep that night. Every noise outside my window, every creak of the building settling, made my heart jump into my throat. My mind kept replaying that message, the threat that hung over me, like a guillotine. Morning finally came, and I dragged myself to work, feeling like a zombie. As soon as I walked into the office, I could tell something was wrong. People were gathered around in small groups, whispering, throwing anxious glances at me. I ignored them at first, just trying to make it to my desk without breaking down. But then, I caught part of their conversation. They were talking about Tim. I heard they found his car in some abandoned lot, one of my co-workers was saying, her voice hushed but urgent. But no sign of him, another voice chimed in. 
Yeah, but get this. His phone was in the car. The last call he made was to 911, but the line went dead before anyone answered. I felt like the floor had dropped out from under me. A missing car. A dead 911 call. This was getting worse by the minute. I knew then that I couldn't keep going like this, pretending that everything was fine. I had to find out what really happened to Tim, and I had to do it before the operator made good on their threat. But how do you fight something that's lurking in the shadows? Something that can make people disappear without a trace? That's what terrified me the most. Sitting in front of my laptop, staring at the dark web address, I felt my fingers hover over the keyboard, hesitating. It wasn't just fear anymore. It was something deeper. This gnawing sense that once I went down this path, there'd be no coming back. But I had no choice. The police were closing in. The operator was watching me. And Tim. God, Tim was gone. Whatever handled meant, I had to know. I had to understand what I'd set in motion. With a deep breath, I typed in the address. The page loaded quickly, the familiar cold interface blinking back at me. Fix your problem. There it was, as simple and cryptic as ever. This time though, I wasn't here to hire them. I needed answers. I clicked on the same message box where I'd initially requested the service. But instead of typing in a complaint, I typed in a plea. I need to speak to someone. I need to know what happened. I hit send. For a while, nothing happened. My hands were shaking as I sat there, staring at the screen, waiting for something, anything, to come back. Then, the screen blinked. A new message appeared, but this time, it wasn't in text. It was a live chat. You've been asking too many questions, Mr. Carter. I flinched when my name appeared. This wasn't anonymous anymore. They knew me. They knew everything. What happened to Tim? I typed, my heart pounding in my chest. I didn't want this. I didn't want him to disappear. There was a pause. I could almost imagine the person on the other side watching me through the screen, maybe even enjoying my panic. You paid for a service. We delivered. I could feel my pulse in my ears, the fear clawing at me from the inside out. What does that mean? Where is he? Another pause. Then, slowly, new words began to appear on the screen. Tim was a liability. You made him a target. I stared at those words, a chill creeping up my spine. Liability? Target? I hadn't asked for that. All I'd wanted was for Tim to leave me alone, to make my life easier at work. But now, it was becoming clear that whatever this service was, it didn't just deal with problems, it erased them. You knew the risks, the chat continued. You asked for him to be gone. Now, he is gone. The word felt like a lead weight sinking deep into my gut. What had I done? I started typing again, my fingers frantic on the keys. I didn't mean for this. I didn't know it would go this far. Please, tell me where he is. I'll do anything to fix this. There was no response for what felt like forever. I thought maybe they'd cut me off, that they were done with me. But then the screen flickered. The message box vanished, replaced by a black screen and then a video started playing. It was dark, grainy footage, but it was enough to make my stomach lurch. The camera was somewhere dimly lit, maybe an underground parking lot or a basement. The camera angle was low, shaky, as if it had been filmed by someone holding it down by their waist. And then I saw him, Tim. He was in the center of the frame his hands bound behind his back, his face pale and bruised. His mouth was gagged, and his eyes were wide, filled with terror. My breath caught in my throat, 
as I watched him struggle against his restraints, trying to say something, but all that came out were muffled, desperate sounds. The camera moved closer, jerky and uneven, like whoever was holding it was enjoying this. Tim looked directly into the lens, his eyes pleading for help, for mercy, for something. I wanted to look away. I couldn't. I was paralyzed. My body rooted to the chair, my eyes glued to the screen. This was real. This was happening. Suddenly, the camera panned away from Tim, revealing a figure standing just outside the frame. They were wearing a hood, their face completely obscured in shadow. Slowly, they approached Tim, stepping into the dim light. They pulled something out of their pocket, something long, metallic. My heart raced as I realized what it was, a knife. Before I could even comprehend what I was seeing, the figure leaned in, whispering something to Tim, something I couldn't hear. Then, with one swift motion, they plunged the knife into his side. I gasped, recording from the screen, but the video didn't stop. The camera zoomed in on Tim's face, capturing every agonizing second as his body convulsed, blood pooling beneath him. His eyes rolled back, his breaths turning shallow, desperate, until finally, they stopped. The screen went black. I couldn't breathe. I felt like I was going to be sick, my stomach twisting and turning inside me. That wasn't just some faceless victim on a screen. That was Tim, my boss, the man I'd worked with every day for years, and I'd just watched him die, brutally, coldly, like his life meant nothing. A new message appeared on the screen, snapping me back to the present. You asked for him to be gone. He's gone. I stared at the message, my mind reeling. This couldn't be real. There had to be some kind of mistake. But deep down, I knew the truth. I'd paid for this. I'd started this nightmare. Now, it's your turn to stay quiet. The next message read, Or the same thing will happen to you. I slammed the laptop shut, my chest heaving my breath coming in short, panicked gasps. I was shaking all over. The image of Tim's lifeless body burned into my mind, replaying over and over again. I couldn't stay here. Not anymore. The operator had shown me exactly what they were capable of, and now I was next. I had dug too deep, asked too many questions. They were watching me, waiting for me to make a move. And if I did, well... I knew exactly how it would end. Grabbing a bag, I threw in whatever clothes and essentials I could find. I had to disappear, just like Tim. Only this time, I had to do it before they found me. But as I zipped up the bag, my phone buzzed again. I didn't want to look. I couldn't take another threat, another warning from the operator. But when I glanced at the screen, it wasn't them. It was the police. Mr. Carter, we need to speak with you immediately. Something's come up regarding Tim's case. The message sent a jolt of panic through me. The police were closing in. The operator was closing in. And I was stuck in the middle, with nowhere left to run. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who to trust. All I knew was that time was running out. The moment the message from the police appeared on my phone, my stomach clenched in a way that made me feel like I'd been punched. I stared at the screen, my brain screaming at me to do something, anything, but I was frozen in place. They were closing in. I couldn't run. I couldn't hide. The operator was watching me. The police were right behind them, and here I was, stuck in the crossfire my life spiraling out of control. I glanced down at the bag I'd hastily packed, realizing just how hopeless that plan was. I could disappear for a few days, maybe a week, but they'd find me. Both sides would find me. And that meant I had one last option. 
I had to face it. Head on. My phone buzzed again. This time, it was a call. I nearly dropped it when I saw the number. It was Detective Mason. I debated letting it go to voicemail, but my hand moved on its own. I answered. Mr. Carter. Mason's voice was steady, but there was an urgency to it I hadn't heard before. You need to come to the station. Now. I... I stammered, trying to come up with something, anything, that would buy me more time. I... What's this about? There was a long pause on the other end, then a sigh. We found more footage. Tim, it's bad. You need to see it. There's no easy way to say this, but you're involved. My heart skipped a beat. They had more footage. Footage of me? The walls were closing in fast. I'll be there, I heard myself say, though I wasn't sure why. Hanging up, I grabbed my bag and left the apartment. My body felt disconnected from my mind, like I was moving on autopilot. I couldn't think straight. All I could see was the image of Tim bleeding out on that grainy video, his eyes full of fear, a fear that was now mine. I drove in a daze, my thoughts swirling. The police knew more than they were letting on. But what if I could use this? What if I could play both sides, pit them against each other? Maybe, just maybe, there was a way to survive this. When I arrived at the station, Detective Mason was waiting for me at the door. His face was grim, his eyes locking onto mine like he already knew what I'd done. But there was something else in his expression something I couldn't quite read. He led me into the same interrogation room as before, the small, windowless box that felt more like a coffin every time I stepped inside. There was another detective there, a man I hadn't met, sitting at the far end of the table. He didn't look up when I entered. Mason motioned for me to sit, and I did, my heart racing. What's going on? I asked trying to sound as innocent as possible. What footage did you find? He didn't answer right away. Instead, he glanced at the other detective, who finally looked up. His face was pale, drawn tight with exhaustion. We found more than just footage, Mason said, sitting across from me, holding his hands on the table. We found him. My breath hitched in my throat. Found him. He's dead. The other detective said bluntly. His body turned up last night, dumped in the river. It matches the description of a man seen on security footage at a warehouse a few miles from here. I couldn't breathe. My head was spinning. Tim's body. They'd found it. The video had been real. All of it had been real. And here's the thing, Mason said, leaning forward, his eyes locked onto mine. The footage... It shows you. I blinked. What? The warehouse where Tim was held. We've got you on camera, Mr. Carter. Leaving the scene. My blood ran cold. This couldn't be happening. I hadn't been there. I hadn't done anything. That's not possible, I croaked. I wasn't... We don't have a clear shot of your face, but it's you. Mason interrupted, his voice low. We know it's you. Your height, your build, even your car was seen leaving the area. You were involved, whether you realize it or not. I felt like the walls were closing in on me, my heart pounding so hard I thought I might pass out. But then I remembered the email, the video footage that had been sent to me, the operator's threats. They were setting me up. They were framing me. No, no, no. Listen, I didn't do any of this, I blurted out, leaning forward. I don't know how my car got there. I wasn't involved. It's, it's them. It's the people I, I hired. Mason raised an eyebrow. Hired. I had to make them understand. I had to explain, but I couldn't come out and say I'd use the dark web to make Tim disappear. That would only make things worse. Look. I said, my voice trembling. 
I... I made a mistake, okay? I thought I could get rid of Tim, but not like this. I didn't ask for this. There's a group. A service. They... they handled it. But they're setting me up. The other detective leaned forward, his eyes narrowing. What service? Who are you talking about? I hesitated. How could I explain this without sounding insane? But I had to try. I had nothing left to lose. It's on the dark web, I whispered, my voice barely audible. I don't know who they are, but they... They make people disappear. I thought it was just a way to make Tim leave me alone. But now he's dead. They're framing me. Mason exchanged a glance with the other detective, both of them looking skeptical, but also intrigued. You expect us to believe that? Mason asked, his tone flat. I know it sounds crazy, I said, my voice cracking. But it's the truth. They've been watching me. They sent me footage of Tim before he was killed. They threatened me. If you dig into this, you'll find them. The room fell silent, the weight of my words hanging in the air. For a long moment, neither detective spoke. They just stared at me, like they were trying to decide if I was lying or if I was just some paranoid lunatic. Then, Mason stood up. We're going to look into this, he said slowly. But if you're lying, if this is some kind of game, you're going away for a long time. Understood? I nodded, unable to speak, the fear gripping me, tighter than ever. He motioned for the other detective to follow him, and they both left the room, leaving me alone in that suffocating little box. I slumped back in my chair, my heart pounding in my chest. They were going to investigate, but I didn't know if it would be enough. The operator was still out there, watching, waiting. I was trapped. The door creaked open, and Mason stepped back inside, his face unreadable. You're free to go for now, he said, his voice low. But don't leave town. We'll be watching. I nodded, too numb to argue. I gathered my things, my legs feeling like jelly, as I walked out of the station and into the cold night air. As I drove home, the reality of my situation hit me like a tidal wave. The operator wasn't done with me. I knew that now. They wouldn't stop until I was gone too. I pulled into my driveway, staring at the dark windows of my apartment. That crawling sensation of being watched settling deep into my bones. My phone buzzed again. I looked down at the screen, my breath catching in my throat. Another anonymous message. You should have kept quiet. A chill ran through me as I looked up, my eyes scanning the dark street. Somewhere, out there, in the shadows, they were watching. And I knew, without a doubt, this was far from over. I found a phone on the dark web that lets me call people from the past. They've started calling me back. All right, so I'll be honest right off the bat. I've done some sketchy stuff online before. Not like illegal sketchy, just, you know, deep web rabbit holes. I'm sure most people who've been on the internet long enough know what I'm talking about. You start off looking for some obscure conspiracy theory and suddenly you're four hours in, staring at a forum thread where everyone's talking like they know something you don't. I've never been big on the whole deep web stuff. No Silk Road, no Hitmen for Hire nonsense. But I've always had this weird fascination with urban legends about it. I like to lurk on those Reddit threads where people share their I found this creepy website and now I'm cursed stories. You know, the kind that make you wonder if you're being watched through your webcam. I never believed any of it until recently. A few weeks ago, I came across this random post. 
It didn't have a title, just a weird string of letters and numbers. Curious, I clicked on it. All it said was, for those who want to talk to the past, download this. There was a sketchy link underneath it. Now, every part of my brain was screaming, dude, don't click that. But, of course, I did. The download took like five seconds, which surprised me, considering I was half expecting some massive malware package. But no, it was just this tiny file called timecall.x. I'm not a tech wizard or anything, but even I know how suspicious that sounded. Still, curiosity got the better of me, so I ran the program. The app opened a simple black window with a prompt. Enter the date you want to connect with. I thought it was some sort of prank at first. Like, maybe it was going to spit out a fake news report or something from the date I entered. I don't know. So, for fun, I typed in my birthday. April 13th, 2007. The screen flickered and suddenly a new window popped up. It looked like a phone dialer, like the kind you'd see on those old school flip phones. I stared at it for a second, not really knowing what to expect. But then, the phone rang. I nearly jumped out of my chair. It wasn't coming from my computer speakers either. It was from my actual phone. My real phone was ringing. The caller ID was blank, just a weird unknown symbol. For a moment, I thought about ignoring it, but my curiosity was in full control by this point. I answered. There was silence at first. I thought it might be some kind of automated message, but then I heard it. A voice, tiny and muffled, like it was coming from far away. But there was something about it that made my stomach twist into knots, because it was my voice, from when I was a kid. Hello, the voice said. It was me. I could hear the exact way I used to talk when I was younger. All the little quirks in my speech. I froze, my mind racing. This had to be some kind of trick, right? But the more I listened, the more I realized it couldn't be. The kid on the other end of the line, it was me talking the way I used to back in 2007. Who is this? I whispered, trying not to freak out. There was a pause, and then the voice on the other end said something I still haven't been able to shake. It was quiet, almost like a whisper, but I heard it clear as day. Is this the future? I hung up. I don't know what the hell just happened, but I was shaking. I thought maybe I was hallucinating, or it was some kind of elaborate joke. But the thing is, I never told anyone about how I used to talk to myself when I was a kid. Like, I would pretend I was calling future me and leave myself little messages, almost like a time capsule. I didn't tell anyone because, well, it was embarrassing. It was just something I did when I was bored. But the thing is, the voice on the other end, it was saying stuff. I remember saying stuff that I'd completely forgotten about until that moment. That night, I deleted the app. Or at least, I tried to. It wouldn't let me. Every time I hit delete, it would just pop back up on my desktop. I ran antivirus scans, malware checks. Nothing worked. The file was just... stuck. I didn't sleep much that night. I kept thinking about that voice about the idea that I had just talked to myself from the past. That's when the call started coming in. So, I didn't touch the phone for the next few days. Honestly, I was trying to forget the whole thing. I kept telling myself it was a prank, or maybe just some glitch in the app. I mean, it had to be, right? There's no way I actually called myself from the past. But then, the call started getting weirder. The first one came two nights after I tried to delete the app. It was around 2 a.m. and I was dead asleep when my phone buzzed on my nightstand. 
I ignored it at first, figuring it was just some spam call. But then it rang again, and again, three times in a row. I groggily reached for my phone, squinting at the screen. No caller ID, just that same weird unknown symbol from before. My stomach dropped. It was him again, little me. I debated whether or not to pick up, but curiosity got the best of me again. I swiped to answer and held the phone to my ear, bracing myself for what I might hear. This time, there wasn't silence on the other end. I could hear breathing, shallow and quick, like someone was panicking. And then, that same voice from before. My voice, but younger. Why aren't you talking to me? It asked. I froze. It felt like I had been caught doing something I wasn't supposed to. The voice sounded different now. Not just younger, but scared. Almost desperate. There was a slight crack in the way it spoke, like whoever, or whatever, was on the other side, was on the verge of tears. I... I can't, I stammered. This isn't right. There was a pause, and then the voice whispered, you're supposed to help me. I didn't know what to say. I mean, how do you respond to that? My mind was racing with all sorts of questions. Help him? With what? This didn't make any sense. But before I could ask, the line went dead. After that, I couldn't fall back asleep. I just lay there, staring at my ceiling, my phone still clutched in my hand. The thing that really got to me was how real it all felt. Like, I wasn't just talking to some random recording or a prankster. It was really me, from the past, reaching out. But for what? And why now? The next day, I tried to push the whole thing out of my head again. I went to work, hung out with friends, did everything I could to distract myself. But the more I tried to ignore it, the more I found myself thinking about the app. What if it wasn't a prank? What if it really was some kind of weird technology that let you talk to the past? And more importantly, what if I did need to help him? My younger self. I know it sounds crazy, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. Like there was something lurking behind those calls that I wasn't seeing yet. That night, I made the dumbest decision of my life. I opened the app again. It still had the same interface, just that simple black screen with the date prompt. This time, I decided to get a little braver. Instead of entering my birthday, I picked a random date. October 3rd, 1999. I don't know why, but that date popped into my head, so I went with it. The phone rang immediately. But this time, it didn't wait for me to pick up. The call connected on its own. Hello? I whispered into the phone, my heart pounding. At first, there was only static, like the call was barely coming through. But then, through the crackling, I heard something. A faint voice, far off, like it was struggling to reach me. It wasn't a kid's voice this time. It sounded older, scratchier. Is, is that you? The voice said. I couldn't place it, but it felt familiar, almost like an echo of something long forgotten. My throat went dry. Who is this? There was a long pause. Then the voice said something that chilled me to my core. I think I'm lost. My mind started racing. Lost? What did that even mean? I tried to ask more questions but the voice just kept repeating the same thing over and over again. I'm lost. I'm lost. I'm lost. Suddenly, the call cut off. The line went dead, and the app closed on its own. My hands were shaking so badly, I had to put my phone down. This wasn't just some prank anymore. This was something else. Something that was slowly dragging me deeper into whatever twisted game this was. Over the next few days, the calls didn't stop. Every night, like clockwork, my phone would ring at exactly 2 a.m. 
always from that same unknown number. And every time, the voice on the other end would get a little bit more distorted, like it was deteriorating. At first, it was just static, but soon, the voice, my younger self, started saying things that didn't make sense. Things like, don't let it take you, and they're watching you. Each call felt like a puzzle piece, but I couldn't see the bigger picture. It wasn't until the fifth night that I realized the voice wasn't just talking to me anymore. It was warning me. The call came in as usual, but this time there was a new voice on the other end. A low, gravelly whisper layered underneath the sound of my younger self. It wasn't saying anything coherent, just murmuring in the background, but I could feel the weight of it, like it was creeping closer with every second. Then, the child's voice, my voice, came through again, clearer this time, but filled with terror. It knows where you are. I didn't hang up this time. I couldn't, because at that exact moment, I heard a sound that made my blood run cold. It wasn't coming from the phone. It was coming from inside my house. The sound that came from inside my house wasn't loud. Just a faint creak, like the floorboard settling or someone shifting their weight in the dark. But in the dead of night, with my phone still pressed to my ear and that distorted voice, whispering things I couldn't make out, it felt like the walls were closing in on me. I sat frozen in my bed, every instinct screaming to move, to run, to do something. But I couldn't. My hands were locked around my phone, and the only thing I could hear was the raspy, overlapping murmurs from the call. It knows where you are. Those words echoed in my head like a warning siren. My heart was pounding so hard, I thought it might explode out of my chest. I forced myself to breathe, slowly, trying to convince myself that it was all in my head. Maybe the sound came from the house settling. Maybe the app was just screwing with my mind. But deep down, I knew something was wrong. I heard another creak. This one was closer. My phone buzzed in my hand, and I glanced at the screen. The call had disconnected, but now, a new notification popped up. Unknown. Caller. Missed call. I didn't recognize the number. It wasn't unknown like before. This was an actual string of digits. But the area code was... Strange. It was the same as the town I grew up in. The town where I'd lived in 2007. Back when I was a kid, leaving those little messages for my future self. Before I could even process that, my phone buzzed again. Another notification. You have one new voicemail. My hands were shaking so badly, I nearly dropped the phone. I didn't want to listen to it, but I knew I had to. There was a knot forming in my gut, telling me this wasn't just random. Whatever was happening, it was connected to the calls, to the app. And now, to me. I hesitated for a second, staring at the voicemail icon, then reluctantly hit play. The message started with silence. Nothing but that soft, crackling static. For a moment, I thought it might be empty. Just another glitch, or weird audio bug. But then, I heard it. Breathing. It was slow. Heavy. Like whoever was on the other end of the line was standing right behind me. Just out of reach. The kind of breathing that makes your skin crawl. Because you know it's not normal. It's not just someone on the other end of a phone. It's something watching you, waiting. And then, through the crackling, I heard a voice that made my blood turn to ice. I see you. I dropped the phone, literally dropped it. The message cut off and my room plunged back into silence. But I couldn't shake that voice. It wasn't mine. It wasn't a kid's voice. It was deep, guttural and full of something I couldn't even name. 
Something that made me feel like I wasn't alone anymore. For a moment, all I could do was stare at the phone lying on my floor. I didn't want to touch it. Didn't want to hear any more. But then, there was another creak. This time, I heard it clearly. Footsteps, just outside my bedroom door. I slowly turned my head toward the door. It was closed, but I could see the faint outline of light spilling in from the hallway, like a thin crack under the door frame. My breath caught in my throat as I stared at it, trying to convince myself that there was no way anyone else could be in the house. I lived alone. I'd locked up before bed. There was no way, but the footsteps continued. They were soft, deliberate, slow. I had to move. I couldn't just sit there, waiting for whatever or whoever was on the other side of that door to find me. Summoning every ounce of courage I had, I slid out of bed as quietly as I could. My feet hit the floor, and I crept toward the door, listening for any more sounds. Silence. I pressed my ear to the door, my heart pounding so loud it almost drowned everything else out. For a second, I considered opening it. Maybe whoever, or whatever, was out there was gone. Maybe I was just being paranoid. But then I heard it again. The breathing. Not through the phone this time. Not some weird digital glitch. It was coming from the other side of the door. I stumbled back, nearly tripping over my own feet, and grabbed the closest thing I could find. A baseball bat. I kept under my bed for protection. My hands were trembling, but I gripped it as tightly as I could, my knuckles turning white. The breathing was still there, shallow and raspy, like it was struggling to get enough air. I took a step toward the door, holding the bat up like it was going to protect me from... I don't even know what. My mind was racing with all kinds of horrific possibilities but nothing could explain what was happening. That's when the doorknob started to turn. I froze. The metal creaked, slow and deliberate, like someone was testing it, like they were waiting to see if I'd react. My pulse was racing so fast, I thought I might pass out. I held the bat tighter, every muscle in my body screaming to run, to do something, but I didn't. I just stood there, staring at the knob as it twisted. Suddenly, the door jolted, like someone had slammed into it from the other side. I stumbled back, my heart nearly stopping, as I waited for the door to burst open, but it didn't. It stayed closed, the handle rattling violently, like whatever was out there was trying to get in. And then, just as quickly as it started, it stopped. Silence. I didn't move. I didn't breathe. I just stood there, bat raised, listening for any sign of movement. But there was nothing. No more footsteps. No more breathing. Just... Silence. I took a shaky step forward, my eyes locked on the door. My hand reached out slowly, trembling as I gripped the doorknob. I braced myself, bat raised and swung the door open in one quick motion. The hallway was empty. Nothing. No one. I took a few cautious steps out, glancing around, but there was no sign of anything out of the ordinary. Everything looked just as it had before I'd gone to bed. Except now, I could feel it. The weight of something watching me. And then, my phone buzzed again. I looked down, and saw another notification. Unknown caller. Missed call. I swiped it open with shaking hands, and my heart sank. It was a text message. I'm inside the house. I stared at the text on my phone screen, my mind going completely blank for a second. My heart felt like it stopped, and I couldn't breathe. The message was simple, but the weight of it hit me like a truck. I'm inside the house. I glanced around, my eyes darting to every corner of the hallway. Every shadow 
that suddenly seemed darker and deeper than it had any right to be. The air felt heavier, thicker, like something unseen was pressing down on me. I wanted to scream, to run, to do anything, but I was paralyzed by fear. I had to think. I had to get out of there. My brain was trying to piece together what was happening, trying to rationalize it, but nothing made sense. The calls, the voices, the messages, they all felt like part of some twisted game. But this wasn't a game anymore. Something, or someone, was inside my house. I backed into my bedroom, closing the door as quietly as possible. My breath was shallow, coming in short, ragged gasps. I locked the door, knowing that it wouldn't really protect me from whatever was out there, but it was better than doing nothing. My mind was spinning, trying to figure out what to do next. Call the police? No. They'd think I was crazy. Run outside? But what if it was waiting for me? I was trapped. Then my phone buzzed again. Another message. Come downstairs. I nearly dropped the phone. My hands were shaking so bad, I couldn't even read the message at first. I had to sit down, try to calm myself. But how do you stay calm when something's inside your house? Talking to you. I swallowed hard, forcing myself to breathe, forcing myself to think. I'm not going downstairs. That much I knew. Whatever was down there, it wasn't good. I wasn't going to walk right into it. But then, as I was sitting there, staring at the screen, something caught my eye. Movement. Not from the phone, but from the crack under my bedroom door. A shadow. I froze my heart hammering in my chest. The shadow wasn't moving like a person would. It was slow, almost slithering, like whatever was casting it was crawling across the floor. I could hear the faintest sound of something dragging against the hardwood, a soft, scraping noise that sent a shiver down my spine. My mind raced. Could it be someone? Could it be an animal? But no, this wasn't normal. Nothing about this was normal. I inched back toward my bed, gripping the bat I had left by the door. If it came in, I'd fight. I'd do whatever I had to. But then the scraping stopped. The shadow disappeared. I didn't move. I just waited, ears straining to hear anything beyond the pounding of my heart. There was nothing. No breathing. No footsteps. No more scraping. Just silence. I glanced down at my phone again, the text still glowing on the screen. Come downstairs. My fingers hovered over the screen, considering whether to respond, but I didn't know what I would even say. What was the point in replying to something like that? What if it wasn't even a person sending those texts? Suddenly, there was a sound, a new one. This time, it wasn't coming from the hallway. It was coming from downstairs. It was a thumping noise, rhythmic and steady, like something heavy was being dragged across the floor. My stomach dropped, and I instinctively moved toward the window, thinking about making a run for it. But then I realized the thumping was moving toward the stairs. Whatever was down there, it was coming up. I held my breath, gripping the bat tighter, my eyes locked on the door. The noise got louder, closer. It was unmistakable now. Something was dragging itself up the stairs, step by step, thump by thump. My mind raced, imagining all sorts of horrific things, creatures, intruders, monsters, but none of them felt quite right. Whatever was coming, it didn't move like a person. It didn't sound human. The dragging stopped and I knew it was just outside my door. The silence that followed was suffocating. I could hear my own heartbeat pounding in my ears, the blood rushing through my veins. The doorknob didn't rattle this time. There was no breathing, no shadow, just stillness. And then a soft knock, a single gentle tap on the door. 
not aggressive, not rushed, almost polite. I stepped back, my back hitting the wall behind me. My legs felt like jelly, but I couldn't take my eyes off the door. The knock came again, a little louder this time. Tap, tap, tap. I opened my mouth to say something, but no words came out. My throat was dry, my tongue heavy. I wanted to shout, to demand whoever or whatever was there to go away, but I couldn't force the words. Another tap, louder still. I was trembling now, my whole body shaking. My mind was screaming at me to do something, anything, but I was rooted to the spot. Then a voice came from the other side of the door, low and quiet, like a whisper meant just for me. Open the door! The voice was wrong. It wasn't my younger self, and it wasn't the deep, gravelly voice I'd heard on the calls. This voice was off, like it was coming from someone who didn't quite know how to speak. It had a strange cadence, almost mechanical, like it was mimicking human speech, but hadn't quite mastered it. I shook my head, even though whoever, or whatever, was on the other side couldn't see me. I wasn't going to open the door. There was no way. Another knock. Harder this time. More insistent. Open the door. I swallowed hard. My palms slick with sweat. My grip on the bat was slipping, and I knew I couldn't just stand there waiting for it to come through. I needed to make a move. I needed to get out. But before I could do anything, the knocking stopped. The voice outside the door went quiet. For a moment, I thought maybe, just maybe, it was over. Maybe whatever was out there had given up. But then I heard it, the soft, almost imperceptible sound of something scratching at the wood, a slow, deliberate scrape that sent a chill down my spine. And then the voice came back, quieter now, but even more distorted. I'm already inside. I didn't wait. I grabbed my phone and bolted for the window, wrenching it open with shaking hands. I didn't care what was down there anymore, or how far the drop was. I needed to get out. I climbed onto the ledge, my heart in my throat, and jumped. I hit the ground hard, pain shooting up my legs as I landed on the grass. I didn't stop to look back. I didn't stop to think. I just ran ran until the house was out of sight, until the only sound I could hear was my own ragged breathing. But as I reached the edge of the street, my phone buzzed again. Another message. I looked down, barely able to focus through the fear and adrenaline. The message was simple, just two words. Too late. I stood at the end of my street, gasping for air, my legs burning from the sprint. My phone was still in my hand, the screen glowing in the darkness, those two words staring back at me. Too late. I should have felt relief, being outside the house, away from whatever was inside, but instead a cold dread was settling in my chest. I didn't know what to do next. Go to the police, drive away and never come back? It didn't matter. I wasn't thinking straight. All I knew was that the words on my phone felt like a promise, a warning, and then, in the silence of the night, my phone rang again. That familiar buzz, the unknown caller, flashing on the screen. I was trembling now, my fingers barely able to hold onto the phone. Every instinct told me not to answer, but some part of me, some twisted part of my brain, knew I couldn't just ignore it. I swiped to answer. The line crackled with static for a second, and then the voice came through. You didn't listen. It wasn't my voice anymore. It wasn't the younger version of me, or even the distorted voice from before. This was something else entirely. Cold, hollow, like the voice itself was empty inside, like it was speaking through a void. I opened my mouth to respond but no words came out. I was frozen again, trapped in that moment of fear, 
unable to do anything but listen. The voice continued, low and deliberate. It's been watching you. For a long time. I didn't know what that meant, but the words sent a chill through me. The thing on the other end of the line, the one that had been calling, the one that was now inside my house. It wasn't just random. It knew me. It had always known me. I squeezed my eyes shut, trying to block it out, trying to make sense of any of this. What do you want? I finally managed to choke out, my voice barely a whisper. There was a long pause on the other end, the static growing louder, more distorted. Then the voice answered, I want you to remember. The line went dead. I stood there, the phone still pressed to my ear, every nerve in my body screaming at me to move, to do something. But I was paralyzed by fear. What did it want me to remember? What had I forgotten? I dropped the phone into my pocket and stumbled back a few steps, looking around the empty street. Everything was so quiet, so still, too still. And that's when I noticed something that hadn't been there before. In the distance, just beyond the flickering streetlight, stood a figure. At first, I thought maybe it was a trick of the shadows, but no. As I squinted, my eyes adjusting to the darkness, I saw it more clearly. It was tall, unnaturally tall, with limbs that seemed too long, too thin. It was just standing there, motionless, watching me. My heart pounded in my chest, the cold sweat running down my back as I took a step backward. The figure didn't move. I could feel my pulse racing, my brain screaming at me to run but I couldn't take my eyes off it. It was like my body was trapped in some nightmare logic, where everything moved slow and heavy. The figure tilted its head slightly, as if acknowledging me. Then my phone buzzed again. I tore my eyes away from the figure, just long enough to glance at the screen. Another text message, but this time it wasn't from an unknown number. This was from me. The sender ID on the message was my own phone number. The message read, Don't turn around. I froze. My heart felt like it stopped. I didn't want to believe it. Didn't want to understand what that meant. My brain couldn't process it. How could I get a message from my own number? How could I even? Slowly, as if in a trance, I turned my head just slightly, glancing over my shoulder, there, standing not ten feet behind me, was another figure, closer this time. Its features were shrouded in shadow, but I could feel its presence. My blood went cold. Its face, if you could even call it a face, was wrong. Hollow, like it had been stretched too thin, like someone had smeared it into something unrecognizable. I blinked, and in that instant, the figure seemed to shift forward, closer to me. I stumbled backward, my legs barely supporting me, trying to keep my distance. I wanted to scream, but nothing came out. My phone buzzed again. I didn't look at the screen. I couldn't. I knew it was another message, but I wasn't sure I wanted to see what it said. Instead, I kept my eyes locked on the figure, watching it as it slowly inched toward me, its movements jerky and unnatural, like it was dragging itself through space. Then, all at once, everything went quiet. No wind, no distant hum of cars, just silence. I glanced at my phone. It's too late. The voice echoed in my head as I realized it wasn't just inside my house, it was inside me. That's when I remembered all the strange feelings, the paranoia, the whispers from the past. None of it was random. It had been there for years, hiding in the background, creeping up behind me, waiting for me to acknowledge it. The app, the calls, the warnings, they weren't trying to protect me. They were drawing me in, leading me to this moment. 
I felt a sudden overwhelming wave of cold wash over me, as if the very air around me was alive, watching, waiting. The figure in front of me, my reflection in a way, a twisted mirror of myself, stood still, its hollow face staring back at me, and in that moment, I knew. I wasn't going to outrun this. I wasn't going to escape. The last thing I heard before everything went black was the sound of my own voice, whispering from somewhere deep inside me, from the past, the future, the thing that had always been there. I'm already inside. 